Um, I'm Katie Glenn Bass. I work in the Free Expression Program of Penn American Center. Penn is a literary organization representing writers and those in the literary community, publishers, editors, novelists, bloggers. We're a big tent these days, um, focusing on celebrating literature and defending free expression. I'm Marcy Wheeler. Um, I know I'm known as Empty Wheel. I am a journalist. Um, and I also, in, in a past life, studied literature in, of dissidents in places like Argentina and Czechoslovakia, um, mostly authors who were supported by Penn. So I'm, this is sort of an interesting transition for my life. But. Great. Um, we want to leave as much of this discussion open to talking to you as well. So I, we're going to keep our remarks pretty brief and then open it to questions and comments. Um, I'm going to start by talking about a survey that Penn did of our U.S. membership last fall and what that told us about what surveillance is doing to freedom of expression and to our access to information more generally. Um, and then I'm going to offer a couple of other data points from other studies that have been done in the post-Snowden revelations era that tell us a little more about how free expression is being affected. Um, so Penn undertook this survey last fall. Because we were thinking, you know, it's, it's a widely shared assumption in the privacy, human rights, and free expression communities that surveillance is harmful. Everyone sort of instinctively realizes that. But how do we know that it's harmful, and in what ways is it harmful? So to start answering that question, we decided to ask our members, um, who make up a percentage of the literary community in the United States, and ask them, you know, why are you worried about this? And if you are worried about it, how is it affecting the way that you work? Um, so we have about 3,500 members in the United States. Penn is part of an international network. There are other Penn centers in lots of countries around the world. We have 144 different centers in other countries. So this survey was only of the US membership of our New York-based center. Um, we're going to be expanding that survey later, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So for this survey, um, before I get into what the results were, I do want to just talk briefly about the methodology because it has some limitations that are good to get out up front. Um, this was a survey only of Penn members, and Penn is an organization that is devoted to free expression, so it would be a natural assumption that if you're a member of Penn, you're already worried about free expression. So it's possible that writers who are not Penn members don't feel the same way about surveillance as the writers we surveyed. Um, but I do think this is a pretty good chunk, uh, a pretty good picture of what writers in the United States States are thinking when it comes to surveillance. The results of our survey were published in a report called Chilling Effects, which is available on our website, which is pen.org, or come see me afterwards and give me your email address and I can send it to you if you'd like. Um, and in this, in this survey, uh, we asked people, first of all, are you worried about surveillance? What do you think about the justifications we're hearing for why the NSA is conducting these programs? And then if you are worried about surveillance, tell us what it's doing in terms of your work. How is it affecting the way that you write? How is it affecting the way that you talk to other people or do your research? And the results that we found were striking even to us. We weren't sure what level of concern we were going to see from people. But we found that 85% of respondents, we had 520 respondents to the survey, 85% of them said that they were overwhelmingly worried about surveillance. 73% of the respondents said they've never been as worried about privacy and press freedom issues as they are right now. We also asked them how they felt about statements like, surveillance is something all governments do, there's nothing that new or worrying about this, and statements like, surveillance is an essential tool for governments in the fight against terrorism. For both of those statements, over 70% of the people who responded to the survey rejected them and said they didn't think those were decent justifications for what's going on. The most troubling findings of the report had to do with the way writers are changing the way they work as a result of awareness of surveillance. Writers reported that they've begun to self-censor in various ways um, as a result of being worried that they're under surveillance in some way. So 16% of the respondents said that they have refrained from writing or speaking about a particular topic because they were worried about surveillance. Another 11% have seriously considered doing that, so that means 27% of respondents have at least thought about self-censoring in some way. 28% have avoided social media activities as a result of being worried about surveillance, and another 12% have seriously considered it, so that's 40% in all. 24% of respondents are avoiding certain topics in their email or their phone conversations, and another 9% are seriously considering doing so. 
We also asked writers to give us some open-ended responses about their thoughts on surveillance, and some of the writers took that opportunity to tell us about topics that they're a little, a little wary of studying these days because of fears over what the NSA is doing. So some of the topics that people said that they've either given up on researching or are hesitant to research include US military affairs, the Occupy Wall Street movement and other left-wing political organizing, the Middle East North Africa region, mass incarceration, drug policy, pornography and other sexual topics, the study of certain languages, and criticism of the US government. Um, some writers also remarked that what we're, do what we're dealing with now reminds them of going through the, pe the period of the 1960s or 70s, the COINTELPRO surveillance programs, Vietnam reporting, threats that they faced in those days, but commented that this feels more sinister in some ways because it's so all-encompassing, it's so broad. There's little limit now to what the government can access and what it can do in terms of watching you. And that made it to some of them feel like an even graver concern than what they had dealt with previously. So what do these results tell us about surveillance and free expression? The first thing that the survey told us was that surveillance is censorship. The knowledge that you're being watched or even that you may be under surveillance is enough to change people's behavior. This is Foucault's panopticon argument um, played out once again. You don't even need to know for sure that you're under surveillance. You just need to know that it's a possibility. That's enough to do it. Um, there's also almost certainly a broader chilling effect happening as a result of surveillance. We see writers as the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to free expression issues. If they are feeling pressed, if they're feeling like they can't speak freely, you're likely to see that reflected in the general public and some of the survey results that we've seen coming out of Pew and other organizations like that reflect that, that people are starting to be a little more hesitant about what they say or what they explore online. Um, this also has a worrying implication for freedom of information or the free flow of information, the stories that readers get to access. If writers aren't producing that knowledge, that's shrinking the overall body that everyone has access to in terms of what we know and how we communicate with each other and debate um, the type of information that gets into the public discourse to begin with. It's sort of, it's this ghost stories idea. It's very hard to quantify, but it's, it's that question of what are we missing because people aren't writing it now because people are too worried about what might happen to them. Um, there's also an impact here on freedom of association. I mean, some of the self-censorship has to do with not speaking to other people because you're worried that they might be subject, subjects of government surveillance or they may be in some way a risk for you. So that means people aren't talking to each other and writers have to talk to one another in order to get their information. Writers depend on being able to talk to dissidents, radicals, pariahs, outlaws even, in order to get their research and to present it to all of us so that we know more about our societies and can debate the issues that we all care about. And we're getting less of that now because people are worried and people are watching themselves. Um, this also has obvious implications for our ability to be informed citizens. How do you hold your government accountable if you're not getting stories about government wrongdoing, about national security and what the government is doing in our names? Um, and on a broader, sort of harder to quantify note as well, surveillance makes us less interesting people. We're less likely to just pursue curiosity and see where it takes us if we're worried that typing in a certain Google search term might get us in trouble somewhere down the line. We're less likely to explore ideas on the margins of society and try to tease out new information about those. We're becoming less curious. Um, we're sort of shrinking into a, a smaller version of ourselves and an impoverished body of information that we're presenting to other people. Um, so Penn, on the basis of that survey, decided that we wanted to find out more about what this means for writers and what it means for free expression more broadly. In the coming months, we're going to be revising that survey and putting it out to our fellow Penn Centers in other parts of the world. As I mentioned, there are over 100 of them in various countries, and we're going to ask them to send it out to their membership um, and find out more about how they're reacting to surveillance, both from the NSA and from what their countries are doing, since as we know, the NSA is sharing information with other governments. They're all working together on this so that we have more data to use in terms of figuring out what exactly this is gonna mean for free speech in the future. We're also interviewing writers to get a better, more detailed sense of how it's affecting individual writers and their work and craft. And we'll be presenting that in a report as well. Um, 
To wrap up, before I turn it over to Marcy, I just want to talk about a few other studies that I've seen that I found quite interesting in terms of what they tell us about surveillance and free speech. Um, so the first is an MIT study that came out of Google Trends data, which is all public information, on various search terms and how often they're searched for. And they compared, um, they took the Department of Homeland Security's social media watchword list, so words like dirty bomb or anthrax, and they compared trends for those search terms before the Snowden revelations came out and after the Snowden revelations came out. And what they found was that um, terms on that DHS list had declined in terms of frequency, search traffic frequency, by about 2.2% on average, which is a statistically significant decline. Um, so it does seem like people are hesitating to explore terms that they think might get them in trouble. They are aware that there might be eyes on them somewhere. Um, there's another report that was put out by the City University of New York's law school by their Creating Law Enforcement Accountability and Responsibility Program. They were looking specifically at the NYPD's surveillance of Muslim communities in the Northeast. As some of you may know, the NYPD was engaged in pervasive blanket surveillance of a lot of these communities. Still is. Yes, still is, on so-called uh, terrorism concern grounds. The reason I find this interesting is it's not entirely online surveillance. It's also surveillance of your whole community, but it is a microcosm of mass surveillance. This was not targeted unless you consider everybody who is Muslim a target. This was a blanket surveillance program, it is a blanket surveillance program of an entire community. Um, what CUNY did was to go interview people in those communities and talk to them about how the awareness that there were informants in their communities, that they were under watch all the time, how that had affected them. And what they found was really devastating. There's a serious effect on free speech. People are shying away from any sort of political topic, even just in coffee shops. If somebody brings up a political topic, everybody else is like, oh, let's not get into that. Students on college campuses are avoiding getting active in any way, any form of campus activism. More broadly, I think surveillance on campus is an underexplored area that we need more research on because it's becoming more and more frequent. There's also serious damage to religious freedom. People don't feel safe in mosques anymore. People are looking around and wondering who's there to watch them. Um, and it's, it's tearing at the fabric of the entire society. People don't know who to trust. People don't talk to each other. People are constantly looking over their shoulder. It sounds like East Germany, but it's happening in the United States, and it tells us a lot about what's going to happen as these surveillance programs become more and more pervasive. So finally, um, what I'd like to hear both from, from you and from Marcy is broader questions as well that have been on my mind. What impact this is going to have on our ability to remain anonymous and what that's going to mean for our willingness to engage politically at all. Um, it's becoming harder and harder to do anything without being detected if somebody really wanted to. And traditionally, a lot of political activism has at least involved some degree of anonymity or ability to conceal what you're doing um, until you're prepared to come out publicly. So what does it mean? Are people still going to come to protests if they know that the police can track you at that protest, can keep a record of you at that protest, can cross-reference it with all the other records they have of you, even if it's a completely peaceful protest? The other thing that's on my mind is the impact of freedom on the press. Um, in many ways, this is obvious, and our survey showed that our members who are journalists are particularly worried about all these issues, especially contacting sources and being able to protect their sources. Um, so I would be very interested to hear Marcy's thoughts on all of that. Um, yeah, I'm listening to Katie and realizing how screwed I am because I cover all of those <laughs> things. Um, my, my trajectory as what you might call a journalist has been rather interesting because I started in 2003, 2004 um, using a soft pseudonym at a time when I was still working for a large automotive company. I was contracting to them, so I'm not on their books. But, um, and I worked under a pseudonym partly because that's how I started, partly because at that point it was a way to, uh, I mean, it, it was an interesting gender play because people assumed I was male for about the first four years that I wrote until all of a sudden they saw my face. Um, but, but, but largely because I was, I, the, the first story I got known covering was the scooter, the CIA leak investigation. Um, and although my counterpart on the right and I worked pretty closely together and kind of agreed with each other about, about a lot of what we were writing about, I was writing about a story that was designed to make Dick Cheney angry um, and did uh, because I was one of the few people actually covering his side in the thing, his side in the story. Um, and, I, and I didn't want it to make it easy for 
from a political standpoint, people to tie me to my employer. Um, so when I, I, I mostly worked for that employer in Asia, and the Chinese, I'm sure, were surveilling the heck out of me to get my automotive data, but they didn't care. They were probably quite happy that I was being mean to Dick Cheney in the United States. And it wasn't until, um, and I, I ended up stop, I, I stopped doing that consulting in 2007, partly because um, the, the last contract I had with this company was working in dealers in the United States. And I was, I was sitting with a, um, I'm sure, very conservative service manager in Nashville, Tennessee, and looking around and going, I can't represent this company anymore. And at the same time, be this political, this, this, this recognizable voice um, engaging in these political issues. So, um, but, but that was a time when I still believed you could, be, you could be a pseudonym. And a pseudonym meant, I mean, it was very easy for anybody to find Marcy Wheeler equaled empty wheel. But it, it, the pseudonym played a function for me, and I believed you could do it. We're well beyond that now. Um, and and, and I, you know, I think there, there still is a really important case to be made for pseudonymity, especially, I mean, because otherwise, most employed people in this country can't engage in free speech. Because you can be fired for political activism by any employer, just about. Um, and therefore, there, there are many, many, many employers uh, for whom if you want to engage in political speech online, you better do it under pseudonym. But the notion that you can protect pseudonyms anymore is just uh, well beyond, you know, it's clear that you can't. Um, but then since the Scooter Libby trial, I've still been covering all of these national security stories. Um, many of you probably know I had a brief associate, I mean, and, and during that period, I mean, I'm, my shtick is, is kind of open source stuff. I find the stuff that's sitting there in plain sight. Um, and so for a long time, I kind of was radically open. I was like, I want the government to know that I don't have secret sources, because they assumed that I, I did. They assumed somebody was telling me where to go look for this stuff, and I was just finding it on my own. Um, and it, you know, some of the first concerns about surveillance I had came not from, I mean, I do think there is a credible case to be made that the two-person questioning I got on the day of the Scooter Libby trial where they knew that I had written a book and they looked at every single business card in my suitcase was not an accident because clearly they knew who I was when I came in. Um, but it was more, that was more kind of deliberate, we're, we're, you know, we know who you are. Of course they knew who I was. They saw me in the courthouse every day. But, but um, the, you know, the, the first time I became concerned about covert surveillance of me was not the government. Um, it was when I was covering a story on the Saudis and covering certain, covering a relationship between the Saudis and the United States, which is largely about slush fund dollars, probably about um, a very interesting military structure that we have in place on, this, on the Saudi soil. And that's when weird stuff started happening. So quite honestly, it's not my government that I thought was first surveilling me. I, it's, it's whoever had, I mean, it could have been, con I also live in West Michigan, which is Eric Prince's home. Like his, his family runs that joint. So I, you know, I, every once in a while I'm like, I, I, I live in this place where the, the family that runs it has, a, has an army of mercenaries that I've pissed off before. That's probably not a very good uh, long-term success model. But, um, but, but as we talk about surveillance, I think it's really important to remember that even in the United States, the, the, the people who are surveilling you might not be your government. Um, and then all of that changed when in January, for a while, I had an affiliation with The Intercept and went through the process of figuring out how to get Edward Snowden documents into my house um, and, and imagining all of the people that all of a sudden we're going to try and surveil me. And so my understanding of surveillance kind of radically changed, um, which, was a, which was a good learning process. I'm, I'm sure I'm still not adequately secure. And, and all I was protecting, I mean, I, you know, I do talk to national security sources. Um, I don't live here in DC, so I can't talk to them in person, which means I can't do a lot of that. Um, you know, and I have people who, at now who I think want to talk to me about something and, and they're sort of like, sometimes I vacation in Michigan and that's how they reach out to me. Sometimes I vacation in Michigan and, and then the notion is that somehow I'm gonna end up at the beach talking to these national security sources because I, I'm not here in DC so I can't go, go meet with them. Um, but but uh, the funniest bit of surveillance came a couple weeks ago when um, the Fusion Center in Boston was made to release a bunch of documents of their surveillance of Occupy Wall Street 
or Occupy Boston, and there I was um, because of tweets that I had sent about an Occupy event in Boston with, for those of you who were in the advocacy meeting yesterday, Kate Crockford, was all, it was me, her, and Asher Wolf um, were being surveilled uh, by Boston's Fusion Center for tweeting about an Occupy event. Um, I was in Michigan when I tweeted it. Asher was in, I think, Australia when she tweeted it. So there was no chance we were gonna even be at this protest but nevertheless, we're in their files. And I, you know, I reflected on that, and, and it, it sort of made me, getting back to the pseudonymity question, it sort of made, you know, at one degree I was like, you, you gotta have more on me than this. Like, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna die and have this be the extent of the state surveillance of my activities, this tweet that I made. Um, but, it, but it made me, I mean, one of the things we're learning, um, thanks to Edward Snowden, is, you know, I was empty wheel on Twitter. I'm, I'm empty wheel everywhere. Um, so in spite of the fact that everyone knows I'm Marcy Wheeler now, um, w the government no longer needs to know who, you know, know your name. They, that, that, that's the least interesting thing to them. Um, the, Edward Snowden, one of the best descriptions of this he, uh, to the EU Parliament talked about the fingerprinting process that, ne that the NSA does. Um, and you know, all, those of us who've been covering this have, have kind of talked about it along the way, but he described it really well, and it's, and it's, it, your identity is no longer Marcy Wheeler. Your identity is your email address, emptywheel at gmail.com, emptywheel, at emptywheel on Twitter, emptywheel on Facebook, your cookies, and these are, the, the cookies are really the most interesting part of this, um, particularly if you're Muslim, but not just if you're Muslim, certain purchases. I mean, they will track, uh, pressure cooker purchases. They will track, this, this is, in 2009, I figured out that they were doing massive collection under the Patriot Act because there were people uh, investigated, associated with the Najib Bulizazi case, who had purchased beauty supplies. They appear to have been innocent because they never appeared in any other legal documents, but they purchased beauty supplies in Aurora, Colorado, and therefore were investigated by the FBI, and I presume they were Muslim, and I presume that the FBI went and knocked on their door and said, um, tell me about your neighbor who bought some acetone. Can you know? Tell me about and and that's kind of a story that we never get to see the false positives, right? Um, and so the notion of identity has changed, and we are no longer Marcy Wheeler. This is what I do. We are Marcy Wheeler. Here are the Google searches I've made, and here are the people that they have tracked my geolocation sitting next to, and these are the people that I've called over the over the last year. Um, I found myself recently, I'm kind of chuffed about this, I found myself recently having an email conversation with somebody who I knew was two degrees away from somebody very, 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 very high up in the national security establishment. And I, and I, I find myself doing that now. I'm like, I, I wonder how many two degrees of separation I can have with people who immediately wouldn't be investigated um, because that's a way of protecting myself. Um, and, and I actually, you know, I, I kind of think that's a way to survive this. Um, and then the one, other, the, the one other example I sort of wanted to bring up, because I think it's, it's the, the leading edge of where they're going with surveillance, is one of, the, one of the documents I work on a lot is Inspire Magazine, um, which is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula puts out this kind of glossy magazine, um, believed to originally have been put out by an American who moved to, to Yemen. Um, so it's very sexy, although a lot of people think that the CIA actually put it out. The first edition of it was hacked. Um, it's, it's, it's the one that everyone talks about that gave you a recipe for how to build a bomb in your, mom's, your mother's kitchen. Um, it also allegedly and probably falsely was claimed to be the source of the Marathon Bombers recipe for their pressure cooker bomb, their, that there was a pressure cooker bomb. But the, but the magazine is important and interesting for a bunch of other reasons because um, it is interesting ideologically. It is interesting from a document production standpoint. I mean, how are they doing it? Where are they doing it? I've investigated it partly because there was a um, Vietnamese Brit who the Brits, he's still in secret detention and I'm allowed to speak about him here but people in the UK are not legally allowed to speak about him. Um, but he allegedly had a role in producing Inspire and then came back to the UK and was, um, in the UK, Inspire is illegal to have on your computer. So because I download Inspire on this computer, I, you know, I, I literally have to clear out my computer before I go visit my brother-in-law in the UK because it is illegal to have that on your computer and you can go to jail for two years just for having it on your computer. But um, 
Um, but it is, this is a really interesting case of this guy who supposedly was the graphic artist for Inspire and who is being, they're trying to deprive him of his British citizenship so they can deport him and drone kill him or something. Uh, or actually I think they're gonna send him here and they're gonna, they're gonna um, convict him here because that's what's gonna happen. Um, and and I, so I, you know, one of the reasons I've downloaded Inspire is to understand this case, which is an interesting case because it's secret, which is an interesting case because it's a, it's a very important British case about free speech and I'm allowed to speak about it here. But Inspire is also, um, also shows up in, I guess, at least 25% of the case of sting cases. So young Muslim men who the FBI finds and sends out undercover officers and eventually gets them to press a button and then they arrest them as an attempt to use a WMD. We hear that story over and over again. But, but Inspire seems to be one of the first tip-offs that the FBI is using to find these men. Um, and therefore, it is a reason to start an investigation into young men. And since the, I mean, even before the Snowden Declaration, the, uh, you know, there's been this discussion of how they're tracking Inspire, how they're finding Inspire in these, in these men's computers. Um, I believe that they actually knew of Tamerlan and Tsarnaev partly through this before, I mean, the, the IG investigation into the Marathon bombing attack said that the NSA actually had stuff in their possession they just didn't do anything with it before the actual attack. But, um, but, but, I, but I, my theory on how they're doing it is they're doing it in the upstream collection, which is the Section 702 collection off of the, um, off of the switches, off the telecom switches, and they're packet sniffing all of that. And they're, when the government speaks about it, they say we are searching for things such as uh, phone numbers and email in the content of, email addresses in the content of email. Um, but that such as also hides that they're searching for malware um, and there are codes within Inspire that, you know, people, there's a decryption code and then there, there's also a theory that, it, that, that the NSA has always hacked and put code into the, to Inspire. So it's the kind of thing that is going to get you picked up in this upstream collection. And um, it was very funny because I was talking one day with Nada Bakos online on Twitter who, um, is the woman, she was one of the women who targeted Osama bin Laden. She worked for the CIA for many years, was an analyst, was very good at, at, at uh, targeting. She's like, wait, but I've downloaded, and I've downloaded Inspire. I'm like, Nada, I don't think you fit the profile. You killed Osama bin Laden. They don't think you're a terrorist. But it, but it, is, it, but it, is, uh, but it is, I think, really the leading edge of the kind of surveillance that they're doing and the way in which they can collect information on, you know, I have a perfectly legit, and, and, and I, you know, I sort of think of it this way. I need to make sure my profile stays high enough so that I'm allowed to download Inspire so that my, you know, there, there are actually sites in the United States where terrorism investigators will go and, and they, they say among themselves, this is a clean copy or this is a safe copy and I've never, you know, they seem to know what that means. And sometimes I go there and sometimes I go to the bad sites to download Inspire, but you know, you, you sort of have to maintain your profile high enough to be able to investigate this stuff, otherwise then it's gonna be cause for targeting. And, and terrorism is the leading edge of this, right? But I do think you know, the notion that you should be worried about investigating Occupy Wall, Occupy Wall Street or Anonymous or what have you is very real. I mean, the, the model that they've rolled out to investigate terrorism is very clearly being applied to other dissident groups, and we should assume that, that those methods of surveillance are gonna be adopted across the board there. So, I'll stop. Let's have a conversation. Anybody have questions or comments? Aesthetics? Yeah, I think, is that microphone on? Why don't you try it? No, it's not. Can you see if there's a switch on the bottom of it, maybe? There you go. There you there go. go. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the thing that occurred to me as you guys were discussing all of this is basically, I, I suspect that one of the reasons, uh, for example, reporters might not be willing to report on this kind of stuff is because they might lose their jobs, which is effectively loss of finances, which is loss of sustenance, you know, house and home and such. And it occurred to me that at least, I, I don't know the Constitution super well, but I think there's a, an amendment that says that Congress cannot change Obama's salary. 
And I was curious if there is some way that you could use that as a leverage tool, or basically say how to defund not just the NSA, but people within the NSA, mm -hmm. because they don't seem to care because what's going to happen to them? And it seems like using financial leverage against them could be useful. Well, but the other thing is that, you know, that the, the leverage that, I mean, we didn't talk about this, but one of the most important things going on in the issue of free, exp free expression is that people with clearance, and not just people with clearance, they, in the la under the Obama administration, they've rolled out um, sensitive uh, positions, which are people who stock Gatorade on military bases at the, at the you know, this, the, whatever it's called, the commissary. Um, those positions are now defined as sensitive and they no longer have merit protection. So they, you can be fired for no reason, even if all you're doing is stocking Gatorade at the commissary. But obviously people with clearance, they have rolled out a whole new series. I mean, Clapper very recently said, you can't have any conversation with the media that's not pre-cleared about something that is your job, whether or not it's classified. And that applies both to people who are still working for the government and people who used to work for the government. And even at the level I work and people who I used to be able to have conversations on the phone with, they're like, I can't talk to you now. I, I don't even want to accept your call now because they are tracking these kinds of things. I also have a family member who's involved in the, you know, in the, the national security industry. And, and I repeatedly tell him, don't talk to me. You know, like, don't stop calling me. And, it, and it, that's sort of nuts because, you know, he's sort of, he doesn't live in D.C., so he's a little bit incautious about it. And he's like, oh, they're not, they're not watching you. I'm like, no, they, they really are, trust me. And, and, and so, like, there's this perverse other side of it, which is that the people who work for the government, some of whom are perfectly honorable people and some of whom aren't, um, I mean, ba basically what the government has done for security holders, for, for clearance holders, is set up an, an, a completely arbitrary system by which they can be fired for any reason, um, and also rolled out protections on commu basic communications um, that, that I think makes them very paranoid. And even at a basic level of having, let's have like a, a middle level person who's the person who actually knows how to do things rather than the, the boss who gets reported to, let's have them talk to the press every once in a while. That's not allowed anymore. I mean, even just on a basis, basic, like, it's not classified, it's something that we should know about, those people should be allowed to speak to the press because they're the actual smart people, and that's not allowed anymore. So, so our understanding of what the government is doing is really collapsing, and it's going at both sides, that they're, that they're surveilling the journalists. Um, and, oh, by the way, all of the protections they're talking about doesn't address the fact that still, according to the FBI, they can use national security letters to get journalists' contacts um, so all the discussion about whether or not you can subpoena a journalist is meaningless if they've already gotten an, an NSL to get your phone records. Um, but also at the government side, they're also surveilling the people who might be sources even more aggressively and I think really in an ugly way, a really unhealthy way. Questions, comments? Good morning, I'm Jeffrey Ritter. Uh, first, thank you for your courage in doing the reporting. That's terrific work and I'm very pleased to see you and know you and do what, see what you do. Um, I think that your opening comments have provoked me to, to see an issue that I wanted to raise for both of you to consider. Um, and you said, no one knows who to trust. And clearly, what I think your report provided in your brief remarks is we can't trust our own computer. We can't trust mm -hmm. the information there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, surveillance, ubiquity, everyone's talking about it, but how can we reverse the trend? How can we build that trust at a national policy level, at the community club level, where I can make a comment regarding pressure cookers that I use for my rice uh, and not feel that I'm going to be reported? To me, that seems to be kind of the grand challenge that this is presenting is that we've built this net without building trust into its architecture. And we can be very upset, and I can share you know, your anger, your frustration, concerns, insecurities, but at the end of the day, at my age, uh, which is a bit more experienced than yours uh, in life, I, I want to find a path forward, mm -hmm. right? 
And it seems to me we have to find a way to build trust so that I can go to a synagogue, so that I can go to a mosque, so that I can cheer for a particular football team and not feel like someone's going to be associating me with that fact. Yeah, I always joke with people like, well, you're white, so you're probably fine talking about pressure, pressure cookers. And, that, and that's not a joke at all, obviously. I mean, I live in Michigan, so I live in you know, one of the highest populations of Arabs, and there have been three examples of people arrested with, with pressure cookers going to a potluck. I, I kid you not, I kid you not, but all Arab. Um, and, and one of the things we need, to, I mean, the problem with the counterterrorism model, and so there, there, are, there, are two itch, there are two issues. One is the technology that enables it, and, and that's one problem we need to solve. But the other problem is the model that got rolled out under counterterrorism, which permits the, I mean, the, the FBI literally says they, they, they changed the rules in 2008 and 2011. They used to not be able to investigate you for First Amendment activities, religion, poli you know, political speech, what have, assembly. Um, and they changed the rules, and they now say that they can investigate you if that's not the only reason. So it could be, um, and the phone dragnet stuff, that's all supposed to have a First Amendment protection as well, but uh, they don't believe association is protected under that. If you look at the cases and the way that they're arguing that, they, they sort of get around association being protected under the First Amendment. So, so long as you're not, they're, they're not investigating your, your phone dragnet records because you are Muslim, then they feel like it's okay even though it's associational. So one of the things we need to do is push back against the counterterrorism model. We need to say that, and, and I, I don't know the answer to this, because I joke sometimes and I say, if white terrorism was investigated the same way that, that Muslim terrorism was investigated, then you would see, you would not see the same tolerance anymore for what is done to the Muslim community. And I think that's true. I think when you see the language of people like Rand Paul, who actually cares about people who have been alleged to be white terrorists, that's his motivation. A lot of the a lot of the Tea Partiers are motivated to protect ugly speech on the right, white person's ugly speech on the right, and 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 I I sometimes I think that's a horrible thing, and sometimes I think that's a good thing. But I think that what has happened is that it's too easy. I mean, this Edward Snowden thing. I can't tell you how many number of anti-war liberals have said, "Oh, it's not like COINTELPRO." You know, oh, they're not, you know, and the reason they're allowed to say it's not like COINTELPRO is because mosques are being invaded and not black churches. And even the black churches, I don't think in the 70s people really cared as much about as they did about anti-war rallies. So we have, to, we have to develop an empathy among the white liberal community, right? You know, um, and that's, that's part, so, and we have to get a different model for counterterrorism. Because, because the model that exists now is, is guilt by association. Um, and, and we need to break through that. And I think we need to break through that by, you know, partly it happens in the courts. Partly it happens that, you know, we, we need to win some of these bar borderline terrorism cases. There, the, um, there, the NATO three in Chicago, which were white terrorists um, protesting NATO, they were charged as terrorists, they were found guilty, but ultimately the terrorism designation was not used against them. It was a state level terrorism case. And that's an example where when white people get charged as terrorists, we begin to get uncomfortable with the notion of, with that, with the way we've defined terrorism in this country. Um, and, and I think that's important. That needs to happen and that needs to happen on Muslim quote-unquote terrorism because a lot of the cases that are being I mean I don't know how many of you know Tarek Mahana that that case it's a it's a um, it's a case of a Boston man Boston area man who um, he was convicted in part in large part for translating hateful speech but for translating YouTube videos and the logic was that he was materially supporting Al Qaeda not because he had any connection with Al Qaeda but because he was doing something that benefited Al Qaeda. In that case, he was convicted, he appealed to the, to the First Circuit, and the First Circuit upheld that. And that is one of the most, that is the kind of leading edge of where they're going to criminalize speech. And that, those cases are the ones that we need to draw attention to and fight back against because it's intolerable that some, I mean, hateful speech is protected in this country, but not for Muslims. 
I mean, literally, that's where we're at right now. And if it's not, you know, it's that, that old adage, if, if Muslims can't engage in what is considered unhealthy speech, then none of us will be in 10 years, so. Um, I'd agree with everything that Marcy said. I would add just a few things to that in terms of, um, I mean, this is really the opposite of building trust on computers, but uh, as someone who comes at this not from a journalist perspective, but from a human rights perspective, I would say that one thing I've observed in my own work over the last few years and in a lot of human rights organizations, um, I used to work in Zimbabwe for a human rights lawyers group there, and I also did a lot of um, investigation of human rights violations in the Occupy Wall Street movement in New York. And in both cases, the answer we came up with, as unhelpful as it is in some ways, is to keep it off your computer as much as you can. I mean, we, we went really old school, which was in a lot of ways um, more time consuming than it otherwise would have been, but the only solution we could have come up with at that time was keep it all on paper or keep it in your head and try to keep things mixed up so that if somebody gets hold of your papers, it's harder for them to put together names and notes and things like that. For the Occupy report that I worked on, um, we were doing it in a context where we knew that um, the NYPD had uh, subpoenaed the NYCLU's records for the work that they had done on cases of arrests at the 2004 RNC convention protests in New York, where the, and the NYCLU had published a report on violations in those arrests. They had held people for hours in this really weird space at Chelsea Piers and all sorts of other violations. And the, uh, the NYPD argued that they needed to see the records of that human rights report in order to help with ongoing prosecutions of some of the people who had been involved in those protests, which let us know that in order to write this report without getting a lot of people in trouble, we needed a very clear informed consent process for anybody we were gonna be talking to and we needed to figure out how to make it as hard as possible if they did subpoena us, if we fought and lost in, in terms of challenging the subpoena, how to keep things as hard and confusing for them as possible, which meant we ended up setting up all of these sort of barriers in our own way, keeping our notes separate. People's names were assigned numbers and then that went through a couple of different coding areas and then that was kept at a separate institution and then we kept our notes in one space and they were all just hard copy notes. Um, that's the sort of stuff that human rights groups are resorting to these days in terms of trying to keep stuff protected and trying to keep people out of trouble. It's not the way I would like it to be. I would very much like to have tools that would allow me to use technology in terms of the work, but it's something we're thinking about at Penn too because we communicate with dissidents in other countries um, and we do a lot of that online and it's becoming increasingly difficult to do that at all without worrying that we are putting people at risk. So we are constantly trying to think of new ways to either keep our trust going with them online or realize we can't do that anymore and we need to find another way to do it. I think one of the interesting, the most interesting areas where this is, this is going to evolve quickly, I think, is, is among attorneys. Because we know in, in the counterterrorism world, there are about five cases that we can point to where um, attorneys clearly were spied on. And this goes back to um, Azazi, uh, accomplice. The, the, the government believes they can spy on your communications with attorneys so long as you're not indicted. Okay? So in the Zazi case, one of his accomplices in New York, they didn't indict him for about nine months. And um, during that entire period, they were surveilling his conversations with his attorney. And his attorney recently, um, about six months ago, came out and said, well, you know, then they just delivered all of our conversations as part of discovery to me one day. There's a case in, in Portland being litigated right now where, and again, a counterterrorism case where um, the, the government very sloppily was surveilling conversations with an attorney. But it's not just counterterrorism attorneys that are being surveilled. It is also business attorneys. I mean, the, the Snowden case is one where it was a, a law firm representing the government of Indonesia in a trade case. Um, and they believe they can they believe they can surveil anything for trade and and the NSA is very squirrely about what they do with client attorney client conversations although it's clear that their minimization procedures permit them to surveil people so long as um, so long as there's not an indictment involved and the reason I think that this is the leading edge is one because attorneys have the money to pay for good encryption and just I mean I think you're going to start seeing attorneys use tails I think you're going to see attorneys begin to embrace, I, I really hope so, because there's no way they can ethically, I mean, that's the thing, is attorneys have a legally recognized privilege, and the government is, a, is violating it through technology. And so I think the attorneys 
A, because they're attorneys, are going to push back at that because they're attorneys, but also B, are going to start embracing the technology in a way that, that may change the conversation because, you know, I mean, it, unfortunately, the, the, you know, when the ACLU represented Anwar Alaki's family before they often, before they drone killed him, the ACLU had to go to the government and get permission to represent the family first because that was, it is now considered material support for terrorism if you provide legal support to somebody who's considered a terrorist. And they were just representing the father, not, not Alaki himself. But, um, you know, th there's, again, there's this notion that accused terrorists should not have lawyers or that th they should not have protected conversations and there are some ways that the government has, has corrupted that process. Um, but, but that's chipping away at other attorney-client relationships as well and again, those are protected. The, the, the court recognized that those is protected and doesn't, doesn't use the same ridiculous notion that the NSA does which is that they're only protected if somebody's been indicted. So, I saw some hands up over here. Yeah. Uh, both of you, if you could speak about how uh, you encountered challenges in using uh, open government, uh, you know, laws to kind of investigate what's going on in terms of surveillance. I know that you work a lot with, you know, open government data, and uh, I was hoping you could speak to kind of the record on, you know, FOIA when it comes to... You mean that FOIA doesn't work? <laughs> yeah, so was... Yeah, um, I mean, the thing about FOIA is FOIA only works if you're going to sue the government. Right. And so for somebody like me... Um, you know, there, there is a case that I am, that th I am trying to sue the government and I'm, I, I'm hopefully in the next week or so I'm going to talk to a lawyer about suing the government to get a footnote that describes how the NSA and the government currently defines uh, selection term, which is the most critical aspect of the quote unquote reform bill before Congress. Um, it's classified. It's a footnote in the existing phone dragnet orders and therefore we know it's an understanding between the FISA court and the government about how they define this term and it's completely redacted. Um, and they're already, you know, seven days overdue on their response to me on FOIA. So that's the thing is you have to sue them um, and it still is going to take years and years and years and they still, you know, will go through, I mean, it's, it's not working very well, right? Um, and I, I think more people need to be saying one of the reasons why what Edward Snowden did needs to be defended is because you guys don't do even good faith response on FOIA. Like if you can't, if you can't, you know, and the, and the arguments they're making these days, I mean like the, the New York Times ACLU case for this drone FOIA, which is the basis for the government killing an American citizen with no due process. Um, you know, they, they say, we're not going to appeal this. This is, you know, they, the circuit court has said you have to release this. And they're like, we're not going to appeal this, but we're going to kind of change the rules a little so we don't have to redact this and we don't have to give you the names of other OLC memos that we relied on. Um, and, it, you know, it's absurd. So at some point somebody's going to leak that and, and tough for them, you know. I don't, and I don't, I don't see that getting any better anytime soon. You know, Obama came in and claimed he was the most transparent administration ever, and that's, that's absurd at this point. It's like such a ridiculous statement that, you know. So it doesn't work. I mean, FOIA doesn't work. Um, although I think that, you know, we're learning if you do sue aggressively. I mean, there, there, are, te there are techniques. You know, I joke, at anyone who knows Jason Leopold, the, uh, internally, the DOJ refers to him as a, toy, a, a FOIA terrorist, and there are a few people that, I, I kid you not, they, 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 that's actually in a DOJ document, I think. Um, and, but the reason they call him a, a, a FOIA terrorist is because he has found way, you know, he's found ways to sort of make it work and to get stuff that, that isn't covered by the, you know, and, and that's, what, that's what we've come to is FOIA terrorism or that's what I think we have to adapt. <laughs> oh yeah, he loves it. Every time I call him one, he's like, yes, I'm a FOIA terrorist. But, um, so it's not working. And, it, you know, and, and there's a lot of data. I mean, it, 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 there, are, there is a lot of stuff that you can get open source. I mean, you know, like on this surveillance bill that is passing Congress, um, there was a debate about whether or not it would change ex existing programs. And then Mike Rogers came out with a, you know, to some degree there are things that have to be public. And so Mike Rogers, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, who's 
not a nice person, came out and wrote a bill report and he said, this doesn't change any program except the phone dragnet. And not only, I mean, that's the legislative record, so that's how the courts are gonna interpret it, so it doesn't matter whether the letter of the law would have changed the other programs. Once he said that, then you know the government basically would always be able to point to that and say, this doesn't change any other program except the phone dragnet. And so, you know, as soon as he had that, and I, it was public, and I'm like, look, you know, we can argue about what this bill does, but Mike Rogers just put it in the legislative record that it doesn't change everything, and then some more people were like, oh, oh, that maybe, maybe you're right, you know. So, you know, it, it's it's partly where you look for, where you look. It, it, a lot of documents don't get read that have very interesting information in them. I think. Yeah. Um, I've had pretty much the same experience. It, it sometimes works if you sue, but it takes forever. And I think for for the type of work I've done, again, going back to the Occupy report, we, we put in FOIA requests, but for reports like that, they need to be timely in order to be useful at all. And by the time we would have gotten anything out of the NYPD, and this is just crowd control documents. We just wanted to know what their policies were on crowd control at protests. And we couldn't even get that out of them. Um, and we didn't want to hold the report until we had that stuff. So by the time you get the documents, sometimes for some of the projects that I work on, they're just, I mean, they're helpful in that it's nice to know, but you've already done the work and the press push and like everything you can get out of the advocacy strategy. So it's just, it's, it's frustrating. Anything else? Last comments, we have a couple more minutes. Yes? Sorry, Mike Godwin. Uh, it, it, with, with one thing that has worked in, in some contexts uh, for me as a, as a policy advocate who, does, uh, who also does media campaigns from time to time, is to uh, assert something that they that 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 the government agency must respond to, uh, if, even if only to deny it. Uh, if they deny it, then at least they're on the record of denying something is true, so that when the FOIA results come in, mm -hmm. you 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 have actually put them in a position of having lied on the record. Uh, that's not always useful, but it's uh, sometimes quite useful. I actually uh, have come to believe over time, much as I uh, love uh, FOIA litigation, that, uh, that public campaigns and media campaigns, especially if they're really uh, mean, mean and mean-spirited and unfair, uh, can be very effective. Thank you. I, I agree with that, but I think even, I mean, the Obama administration has gotten so, er I mean, so in the, um, Amnesty v. Clapper case, which was the ACLU challenge to the Section 702 program, uh, which, was, which, which was decided in 2013 before Edward Snowden started leaking everything, Don Verrilli got up before SCOTUS and repeatedly said, we give notice to defendants, over and over again. We give notice to defendants and they can challenge and they're the ones who are gonna have standing to challenge this program. And those of us who know Section 702 are all looking at each other going, what? Like no one has ever gotten notice before. And the ACLU and a number of other people are trying to get DOJ to at least inform SCOTUS that they got lied to, that that's not true, that that decision was based on false information. And DOJ refuses to do that. DOJ has thus far refused to correct the record with the Supreme Court on a decision that was the basis for them not giving uh, ACLU's clients standing. So, I mean, that's a case where they're getting, it, or the other, the other thing I love is, uh, James Cole, in testimony on Thursday, said, you know, everyone's like, well, how, sh how can we trust this selection term? And James Cole was like, oh, don't worry, the legislative record proves that it's not supposed to be uh, bulk collection and everything. And, and, I, and I was like, 24 hours ago, your lawyers, James Cole, were in Chicago arguing that no one should ever get review of FISA records in spite of the fact that the legislative record clearly says we want some defendants to get review. And your argument is no one ever has, so they shouldn't. You know, I was like, 24 hours ago, you said the legislative record doesn't matter. And yet here you are before the, before the Senate intelligence community saying the legislative record will protect everyone's privacy in FISA. So, I, you know, I just think they're getting so arrogant that, I mean, I agree that embarrassment is a really useful tool. It's getting harder to embarrass these people. <laughs> Hi, good morning, Andrew McDevitt. Uh, I had a question. Earlier in the conversation, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, social media and people's use of it and 
or you know be more cautious about its use and in more recent memory we've seen uh, the advent of these transparency reports of, that are being published regularly by social media, marquee companies, mm -hmm. technology companies. I wanted to know if you could comment uh, on what you think about the, the growing uh, use of those in, by the, the technology companies and what they mean and what you, what you think uh, about them personally. Thank I you. think they're really an important tool and they, you know, with continued attention to them will get more important. I mean, uh, Credo was first, and Credo made it very clear that they challenged some things and not other things. Even strictly from comparing AT&T and Verizon's transparency reports, both of which we know don't include the dragnet, right? You know, so, so we know enough to look at the numbers and say, if you don't show 120 million customers affected, then your transparency report is not honest because we know 120 million of your customers are affected. But, but you can look at that and see that um, Verizon requires a warrant for a lot more things. And I asked a Verizon counsel about that, and he's like, oh, it's because apples to oranges. But you know, I don't think that's actually true. I think Verizon actually demands legal process from the government more than AT&T does. Um, Credo, we know, obviously challenges the government because they also have this NSL case. So we don't, we don't, we're not supposed to know that it's them. But we believe Credo is challenging an NSL in San Francisco. Um, Google has challenged some NSLs and has gotten credit. So, you know, the, the more that, and again, I think this is one of the benefits of Edward Snowden, the more that companies can point to fights that they have made. Now, some of them are bogus. I mean, like the, Verizon sort of made this half-hearted attempt to challenge the phone dragnet order at the beginning of the year. Um, and it wasn't, it was a very half-hearted attempt, but, you know, baby steps, I guess. Um, Verizon is better than AT&T. Google is way better than Microsoft. And, and the more that we can brand these companies with, you know, you, Google may be sucking all of our data, but at least they try and protect it from the government and that makes them marginally better than Microsoft and therefore people should choose, you know, if they're gonna go with one of the big providers, they should go with Google over Microsoft and Verizon over AT&T if they're privacy concerned. Or you can go to these other companies which we know put up even bigger fights. And, 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 and so I think that's useful. But I also think we need to be really attentive to what they're really showing and what they're not really showing. And like I said, I mean, the government has been very cautious about letting the, the I, I hope you all know the, gimmick that the government uses with the word target. Um, because in all of these surveillance programs, they say, well, we don't target Americans. And that means, but they, they you know, they'll, they'll target Anwar Awlaki and then collect all of the conversations with, the, with he's had ever in the world. And including all those Americans who talked to him or sent him plaintive messages wanting to be, you know, wanting to help, wanting him to help marry them. Um, but, but, but those Americans aren't targeted and so they wouldn't be counted in the government's surveillance numbers. Um, the, the, those transparency reports, the way the government has allowed those transparency reports, often will use words like accounts or um, identifier sometimes. And an identifier can be a switch. I mean, we know that the government um, in, in 2007 one of the gimmicks that they used was they said, we want to collect information, you know, we're going to, we're going to define this switch in Virginia and packet snip everything coming through the switch. And whereas we used to have to define a phone number as what we were wiretapping, now we're going to define the switch as the, as the facility, right? And all of a sudden, you know, millions of people were affected, but it counted as one FISA warrant. Um, and so there's always, like, we just, I mean, there is a panel on it. To today, I think, which will, I think, be a really interesting conversation. But we just need to be really, we know enough to know when they're lying to us. And we need to be insistent that they are lying to us um, because they are. I think we're about out of time. Um, thanks, everyone. <laughs>